on this computer. Okay, so a lot of us have spoken about The Shortest Day, and uh, this is a book that I have not read, but when I went looking for art to illustrate this slideshow, this illustrated it perfectly to me. This is my concept that I've had for a long time of what solstice is. It's the shortest day and um, there's all this darkness and there's light coming back. And, and this is a common theme. All you Northerners have mentioned this. Um, so yeah, winter solstice is dark days if you're in Europe or, the, or North America. And um, so, I have never had any particular culture around this topic, um, but these are the kind of images that I've identified with in the past. Um, but my life is pretty different now. Um, if I can use this, you can see Oregon's up here at the 45th parallel. I am now down here at the 20, 20th parallel, 20 degrees north of the equator. So there's quite a bit of difference there as far as darkness up here in winter and not much darkness down here. To be a little more specific, I'm at the tip of the peninsula in this little bay right here with this island out here. And um, so I actually had to look up what this word even meant because I, I hadn't heard this and it means the sun's standing still. Um, so if you're, if you're one to be watching the sun as it moves through the sky, um, apparently, you know, it, well, and I can say this for myself, I see this on the horizon, I'll show you in a minute that the sun rises in a slightly different day, different position every day. And, and so it's gonna turn around and go the other direction starting tomorrow morning. Um, so here's the, here's the view that I get. Um, there's a bay and the sun during winter solstice rises over here and summer solstice rises over the island. And you know the quantity of light in my day is, is not particularly small here. I've got over 10 hours of, of daylight. Um, in contrast, uh, this is for Berlin, you know, only seven and a half hours of sunlight these days, if that even, I'm sure it's pretty cloud covered. Um, but what I'm getting towards is that I have grown up with um, these ideas of darkness and coldness around solstice. But even though I've been in Mexico now for like, I don't know, I've been in Central or South Central or America or Mexico for the last five, five winters. And so that's not my story anymore, but there's still something about the solstice and the equinoxes. And um, that's uh, part of what I'm gonna get into here. So the solstice is, is a length, are a length of day. We know that there's a, a long day in, in summer and a short day in winter. Um, but it's also, it's also a, a, it's a point in time when a sort of a geographical or astronomical event happens. And what this is explaining is that at this time of year, on this day, in fact, there's an exact moment when the sun is directly overhead the Tropic of Capricorn, which is down here in the Southern hemisphere right now. So let's, let's just keep in mind a specific point when you know, the sun and the earth have a specific relationship to each other. And um, that point basically just happened um, for all of us, you know, within the past hour, um, depending on where you are in the world, uh, it just happened. So we've passed that point called the solstice. And uh, I'll go ahead and point out this timeanddate.com. This is what I use consistently whenever I'm scheduling things or trying to figure out what time it is for somebody in, else in the world. And I double, triple check it now because I've messed it up even, but um, it's a great tool if you haven't used it yet. So I want to transition out of this sort of understanding I had about solstices and equinoxes. And I haven't told you any of my personal stories yet, but you know, there's a reason I just thought to put this together. I've just seen this pattern of things happening in my life on equinoxes and solstices. And it wasn't because somebody told me to do something different. It, it might've been because I just had to pick a day, but I, I picked a day. And now I have this human design lens to kind of give me some more data around that. 
Let's see, I'm gonna mention, I hear somebody's microphone open and it's just feeding into my ears. If you wanna check if your mic is, um, you wanna check about your mic being on or off. Let's see, maybe I can look here. Oh no, you all look good. Okay, that looks great. So that's just my own thinking echoing in my head. Okay, so to get towards the HD perspective on this, I gotta make sure you know what an ephemeris is. An ephemeris tells you when a certain astronomical object is going to be in a certain place. Um, and so here is an ephemeris uh, made by Maya Mechanics Advanced Imaging. Um, you can see this is for December and it's telling us the sun, you know, on this day down here, the 21st is in the second line of gate 10 and the moon is here in 53. So this is a fine enough ephemeris. It's gonna be accurate enough, but you know, it's not that precise. It's not giving you, you know, the minutes. And I don't know, I have trouble, um, I have trouble uh, reading this one actually. So I wanna to introduce to you the, um, a different kind of ephemeris view, but first let me just show you how it translates that information from the ephemeris translates into uh, the body graph, which is taking information from the wheel, right? We're gonna be looking at the wheel a lot today. And this is not the wheel from today, by the way, this is not the current transit, but there it is. So this is the, uh, ephemeris view that I, I'm pretty familiar with now. This is from the My Body Graph software from Jovian Archive. And it shows us that here, uh, my time now is about 10 a.m. And so, yeah, sun and earth are still here. I guess we're gonna get close to the third line um, today. And um, so I'm introducing this to your vision so you can see how we have you know, the structure of this. I'm also gonna point out that the moon was in 62 a little while ago. And I'm pointing that out because my earth is in 62, my design earth. And so I'm not aware of how grounded in details I am until I start doing something like this. And I'm like, oh my God, are those details necessary? So anyway, I miss details, I guess, but because I'm the second line, I also am really good at being bad at details. So there's the duality. So um, here's what uh, next year's winter solstice uh, ephemeris looks like. And there's a reason I'm sharing that because they're not exactly the same every year. And so let's just drop right into Christmas day transits. Um, uh, Christmas is, you know, whatever it is. Uh, I grew up with Christmas, not a very Christian Christ Christmas, but I, I think at some point I believed in Santa Claus and, um, you know, I think I stopped Christmas pretty much when I left high school. Um, uh, I've remembered I've flown on Christmas day several times. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, what I wanna point out about Christmas day here on this ephemeris is that this year Christmas day has um, two transits, so to speak. It starts out in the sixth line of gate 10 and then goes to the first line of 58. And so here's what Ra has to say about Christmas transits. It's interesting to note the holidays and the traditional things in the context of design. So at Christmas time, you're either gonna get the sixth line of gate 10, that's a behavioral role model kind of a frequency on that sixth line day, or you're gonna get the first line of gate 58, which is a, a first line fundamental sort of love of life. So yeah. It's not the same every year. The, the frequency that the earth is experiencing, so to speak, is, is gonna be different on different Gregorian calendar days. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a difference between a fifth line and a sixth, a first line and a sixth line, isn't there? And we mostly know that from meeting each other. Um, but this is a, a difference I wanna point out and a kind of a sensitivity that I'm gonna encourage you to develop a sensitivity to the difference between a sixth line day and a first line day. So here's the big story, which isn't that big, but it, yeah, it kind of is. So solstices and equinoxes from the human design perspective, they are corresponding with the sun and earth movement through the gates of love. And this little excerpt is from my 
living your design teacher manual. And there's a little note there because I get bugged, miss details, about the fact that that last part of that sentence is not accurate. The solstice doesn't begin when the sun enters the 10th hexagram per se, because every year it's a little bit different. So let's look here. You know, the sun enters the, the 10th hexagram on the 19th of, of December. That's for 2022. But this year, uh, I guess you can't see it too well. It entered a slightly different day. Not that big of a deal, but for details on a book that I like to rely on, it kind of pisses me off. So let's see these gates of love. How can I talk about them? Can I do it? Let's see here. So here we are, so to speak, with the sun in 10 and love of the self. This is the primary young force, so to speak, being projected on us. It's the second line day projections into ourselves. Um, and what's going to happen is the earth, of course, is going to be on the other side, the duality of that love of humanity. And we're going to talk about the movement of the sun through the wheel going this way through the seasons. So here's a, a more of a body graph image of, of what happens with solstice here. Um, we've got the sun in the love, excuse me. I have the wrong word there. <laughs> Speaking of mistakes, um, it's love of the self, love of the body comes later. So love of the self, let's make that correction. And I wanna put the or not, because it's really possible to land on this day like I did this morning and go, oh my God, <laughs> I don't know if I love myself today. You know, I really am not sure about this at all. And do I even wanna interact with people? Like, do I wanna go to the beach and see the people on the beach or not? It, you know, like, it's, it can go both ways in a single day. Um, but let's talk about going around the wheel. So when we get to equinox in the spring, there is again, another sort of uh, geographical kind of event. This is when the equator is directly uh, closest to the sun, so to speak, or to say that the sun is, is um, you know, kind of the shortest distance from the sun to the earth is to the equator. That's when we get spring equinox, we get the sun in the gate of universal love, and we get the earth, uh, the grounding of the earth in 46, love of the body. So guess what happens around Easter time and spring equinox? You know, there's a lot of sexiness going on. And uh, I'm no expert in pagan holidays. When I was researching this, there's a debate out there around whether Easter is pagan. And, you know, I thought I was up to date by understanding that Easter was pagan, but anyway, maybe it's Babylonian, whatever. But let's just say that the earth is being fed with a kind of universal love and a love of the body. And that, that can result in some hanky panky. Um, going around to summer solstice, my goodness. Um, I, I've been thinking, I'm not even sure how many stories I want to share about things that have happened to me on summer solstice and plans that I didn't, you know, things that happened that I didn't plan on. Um, one of them that really sticks out at the moment is at least three times I have had no plan whatsoever to do something psychedelic on summer solstice, but like sometime in the day, like mushrooms landed in my hand <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing this now. Um, but sometimes I wonder too, I'll show you my G center later, how much of that is this gate 15 and my, my own personal setup to be affected by a gate 15 transit. So I'll get into sharing my personal stuff pretty soon. So that's going around the wheel. We've got the sun down here, love of humanity, summer solstice. And look, here's another perspective. This is, uh, I don't know if there's any historical accuracy to this, but this is just an image I found that illustrates that, you know, there are traditions all over the world that have been looking at the passage of the seasons in a wheel and acknowledging certain dates like the solstices and the equinoxes. So there was a wheel back then, right? Um, I don't know what, um, you know, the culture that originally created the I Ching, I want to say it was Chinese, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the I Ching is at least 3,000 years old, if not older, 
So I'm curious if there's a uh, real kind of imagery in the seasons and, and traditions there, but I'm not familiar with them. So we go through the fall and we come next winter, we'll be back here. <sighs> so simple summary of that. We've got these equinoxes and solstices corresponding with these gates of love. And now I'm gonna talk about how my theories on why I am so affected by these equinoxes and solstices. I'm gonna say this year, maybe I'll have a different theory next year, that my pretty dang open G center is a big part of it. Um, you can see, I only have this one unconscious activation. It's the second line here. I have a 51. So I have the 25 at the other end of that. I have a gate five. So I have an electromagnetic with the 15 and I have the channel 2057. So when 10 comes around, um, I get hooked up also. So when 10 comes around, I get awakening and I get perfected form. Um, when the 15 comes around, I get rhythm of life. So you can see a 1015 transit really hooks me up. It gives me G definition and um, sacral definition. And when the 25 rolls around, I get ego and G definition uh, with the channel of initiation. So to walk you through some of that, I'm gonna share this tool. Um, I'm especially sharing this um, because this was a class that I initially made for manifestors in the LYD. And the, um, so a little education here is that this tool for me has been really helpful. It's the transit tool. It's an add-on to my body graph. It's like 70 bucks or something. And what it does is it, is it allows me to say, show me how the program is hooking me up right now. So this is my, my data here. Um, and then this is the program from a couple days ago. So over here on this side, I can see my activations in blue. So I, I do actually carry the second line of gate 20 and I carry a gate 58, different line. But then these greens are where I'm getting hooked up in an electromagnetic style with, with the program. Um, so I find this very helpful in my process. Um, Someday I should maybe try to get over my addiction to looking at it every day. But right now it's, there's so much learning going on for me to watch this. So there's the tool that I wanted to show you. Um, so me plus a winter solstice transit. Um, this is what I was just talking about. I get the rhythm of life here on my two gate fives, which are my Neptunes, by the way, something veiled there. And I get gate 10 to give me perfected form and awakening. I mean, I mean, if you get to pick some transits, those are nice ones. Um, and they happen twice a year. So um, that's today. Now, um, speaking of my manifestor class, I wanted to point this out. One of the things that this tool has helped me see is it helps me look ahead and say, okay, well, if I do have to pick a day and this is an issue for a splenic manifester. I mean, how do you even pick when to do something ahead of time? That's not my authority. But when I saw um, when I saw this option right here, you see what's happening with the 20s and the 34s. Um, I've had now three or four days in the last three years where, or weeks rather, where I've seen that the the sun and earth are in the same gates as the nodes. And I gotta say, things just happen. It, it really seems like there's a little extra high definition kind of thing going on. So um, when it was time uh, with a few manifestors to pick a day <laughs> to start this class, I, I picked this one based on my experience of noticing that mm, feels pretty in the groove when that's going on. Um, so now I'm going to get into some personal stories about um, what's happened in the past before I understood stuff about what I showed you about transits and about my own G. So this was a day, what, how many years ago was that? This is the day that I asked my husband to marry me. And um, we had talked about marriage. He had put it out there. He definitely put it out there. But, you know, he's a, 
open throw generator and it didn't quite happen. And so some months later, I, on this day said, will you marry me on a particular day? And he said, yes. And um, when I was putting this together, I noticed that um, these are my design nodes. So not only was I hooked up by the program in the ways that I just explained, but I have uh, my design nodes happening in reverse here. So that's interesting. And uh, the day I asked him, will you marry me on a specific day was the spring equinox. And, um, and we did get married that day and it was cool. And um, so with gate 25 in transit, that means with my gate 51, I have the channel of initiation. Uh, my ex-husband, Cody, he has gate 51 as his personality son also, but line five. So both of us had the channel of initiation happening um, on this date that I just sort of picked for, <laughs> for a, a day to get married. Um, so yeah, there's an image of that again. So there's been a lot of things that have happened on these days for me, but I'll just point out that um, on this day in 2001, um, this was the hardest, maybe hardest physical thing I've ever done be, that wasn't involving like surviving being broken. <laughs> but that happened on a winter solstice too, actually. Um, so this was a day I climbed the Grand Teton and it was with, with Cody. And um, this was a day where like every single minute of light counted because this is, there's like no, there's no way to get down. You know, once you get up to the top of the mountain, you have to get down the mountain. And, and we did climb the traditional route, um, rock climbing style with trad gear. And there were some moves I made where I had to like push my pack or, or do something that I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I did it. Like there, I had, I had to make the move and I made the move. Um, and I don't doubt that it was related to the sun being in gate 15 um, and, and also Cody having three gate 15s. So part of me saying all this is, is putting it out there to other manifestors that all these things that I've done that were dramatic and physical, pretty much they all involved a generator that I was amplifying. And <laughs> on a lot of these days, it was the sun that I was like the sun energy that I was using to, to do this feat. And um, yeah, anyway, I'm hearing somebody's microphone on. Um, so there's that day. Also uh, the best concert, like right after that climb, we drove directly to a Radiohead show. So um, yeah, summer solstice week with an epic mountain climb and a Radiohead show in the Gorge uh, or the George, the George Amphitheater in George, Washington. Um, so that's a very memorable week for me. Um, and guess what? <laughs> I was the one who decided when we were going to get divorced too. And um, basically, it was basically fall equinox that um, after the last few kind of rough years of us being together, um, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I need to live alone with my dog in a boat. <laughs> I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. And uh, can we have it done by, by the end of the year? Can we have it done by winter solstice and you know we we worked on it together it wasn't it wasn't a fight at that point it was a peaceful separation and um so basically we signed papers on this day and then the next day this was in 2013 the next day i got on a plane and i flew here to this place in mexico where i had only visited once before and now that i'm remembering it that was a winter solstice when mushrooms ended up in my hand that time that we had visited some years before. So I flew here and I uh, didn't know where I was going to sleep exactly when I arrived and then somebody gave me a house to stay in. So I had this one month alone after the divorce with no plans. Now I understand how perfect that was for a six to a second line body manifester to just be alone during this darkest kind of month. And um, yeah, now that I think about it, I was here exactly a month. So lo and behold, <laughs> I'm teaching a class about the month now. Um, okay, another significant day for me, this was last year. And at about 8.30 last year, I was riding my bike and one moment and the next moment I was in the middle of the road and my femur was in five pieces and I had no effing idea what was gonna happen next. It was one breath at a time 
Um, obviously, I turned out okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's just a lot of story around that, but I'm I'm walking like 98% returned to full full performance now. But anyway, you know, so good things can happen to me on solstices and really traumatic things can happen to me on solstices also. So done with my little personal story sharing for now. Um, I mean, more will come up, but, but you understand the basic idea that we have these astronomical seasons, the sun moves through these gates. And um, this little image was interesting to me. I don't know why the seasons aren't the same number of days. Like how could the spring be 92 days while winter is only 44? I don't know, I'm not saying it's bad, but somehow I, I thought there was more symmetry. <laughs> But anyway, so let's talk about this next month that's coming. So a lot of you have mentioned that, um, that this day seems kind of like the end of the year, this darkest day and the light's coming back. And uh, I, have I have had that sensation as well. Um, and I remember going from winter solstice to New Year's, you know, like that one week and then going, ah, oh, and then it's the new year. Um, I don't do that now. I do observe a different new year. So this might be new for you as well. So we've been talking about how the, the sun moves through the gates and the, um, I'm sorry, let's see. I was checking something up here. I don't, uh, okay. Just gonna make sure, okay. Um, so we've been talking about how the sun moves through a certain gate and that's a certain thing of year. Well, there is a solar year in human design and that is when the sun hits gate 41, which is about contraction. It's about like pruning. Some of you mentioned relationships and pruning relationships. This is the metaphors around gate 41, which I'm not an expert on, have to do with like cutting back the rose bush, you know, back to very little. And you know, the rose bush is going to come back, but you're pruning and you're like, man, I'm taking a lot off. But, you know, by summertime, that rose bush is really bushy. And if you didn't prune enough, it's not going to be so flower, flower filled. So it's about limitation of resources that maximizes the development of potential. And that comes um, later in, the, in January. So I just brought this one up here to show gate 10 at the top and gate 41 is down here. So if we were following the Gregorian calendar, you know, we'd be saying New Year's happens up here, but in a human design perspective, the New Year is gonna happen over here. So practically speaking, um, the new year on, of, of January 1st is energetically, neutrino weather style, not a good time to try to start something new because the energies, we'll just call them that, we'll call them frequencies or whatever, they're, they're still ending things. The, 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 new, the new energy is not here yet. So here's what's happening. Um, in this uh, last week of December, you know, not a bad week. We've got the joyous, you know, can be, but this keeping still, this, uh, this sort of, yeah, this groundedness in not moving. Um, it's a good, seems like a good time to eat. Um, you know, this, the next week, uh, the first week of the year is, is based in, in, oh, I got a typo down there. You can see this should be gate 39. Um, but we've got opposition and obstruction going on at that time of year. Um, doesn't sound like a good time to start anything. This sounds a little better, you know, the, the marrying maiden, gate 54, drive coming out of the root, you know, the beginning of the, um, the, the stream of instinct, you know, the root energy that fuels the tribal stuff. Um, and, you know, you know, gate 53, development and beginnings. That sounds all right. Um, but then we get to go through this funky week. Um, I say funky because this is my design sun earth. Um, and then the third week there, you know, gate 60 limitation. I mean, limitation is not an easy force to work with. I've got an electromagnetic for that. Um, so these are the things that are happening in the first three weeks of, of January. And none of this is, is anything about the program supporting anything new. 
So I want to say it was four years ago when I was here that I first learned about Rave New Year. And um, the I, I bought something that this is sort of related to. I bought from Jovian Archive, and I was, I was just new enough to human design, but I'd studied it for a few years, but some crazy stuff had happened that year. And I was like, oh man, I think I gotta know what this Rave New Year thing is about. So I bought from Jovian Archive a reading, uh, kind of a session that uh, involved Darmen and Leela. And they were talking about the transits for the year and things to watch out for. In other words, there are themes that are going to be sort of super macro imprinted on the year, starting with the rave new year. So let's see if I can explain that better. Here's the one for next year. This is the one for last year. So in transit, this imprinting at the new year included the channel of thinking and um, I don't know, <laughs> Can you observe that in, in society this year? And it observe, involved this channel of, of synthesis right here, this kind of sensitivity to the tribe. So this is a, a graphic made by Mark Germain. He seems to make it every year. And, um, you know, if you want to study up on, on the Rave New Year transit stuff, uh, there's, there's options to do that with him and Jovian and so forth. I will say that overall, I do not observe a really strong, like I just don't observe a lot of this going on very directly. It could be related to my own, you know, ignorance of, of the Ray V. Ching, you know, I, I know it generally, but not intimately. Um, but I would note that the nodes were in the third line. And this is the one that I think I noticed the most is um, third line, Kind of an overall third line theme about the year. So yeah, watch out. <laughs> watch out about, about if you have electromagnetics with these, make sure that you're not making decisions based on, on um, the program setting you up to do something this year. But I'll go ahead and point out just a few of them that seem significant. Um, this year's Rave New Year imprint in, involves um, gate 47 in the third line. This can be a really, really tough one for people. Um, it can be really, really practical to observe it in its exaltation, um, but it can be debilitating also. So I'm curious how much of this we're gonna see. Um, yeah, certainly there's a lot of talk that about, mm, yeah, it's a challenging, uh, political environment out there. I, I try to keep my personal view, but um, there are going to be people that are have difficulty in realizing their self worth this year. And um, so, another thing here, uh, Mercury is going to have this imprint, and so this this is a little more hopeful, so to speak. Um, correction, externalization of contraction. Remember the first line is where the sun starts every year. The first line is gate 41, which is cut it all back. And then the fourth line, the externalization of that has to do with getting along with that. Okay, we've chopped it back. What can we do? Can we survive? We've got something to survive. Okay, what I'd like to point out is that this year's imprint um, has six line nodes. So I'd like to encourage you to just notice that and notice in particular this year, notice sixth line days. You can use an ephemeris, you can check the just now. Um, I'm a sixth line personality, of course. Um, so maybe I have a particular sensitivity to it, um, but I, uh, I think that I'm encouraging people to start noticing the sixth line frequency because we're, we all know that the background, the bigger background frequency is going to shift to the sixth line in, in 2027. And according to Ra, in his own experience, he noticed uh, the background shift 
when he was a teenager that put us into the first line frequency. And, you know, Ra had all these first lines and it kind of turned him on, so to speak. Um, and so I'm curious, maybe, maybe as a six line personality, maybe I'm going to be more chill, you know, when, when stuff's really getting crazy then, or is it going to get really crazy? I mean, we don't really know. Um, but my, my encouragement is pay attention to line days. And if you're going to just pay attention to one, pay attention to the six line days and see, see how you do, see how other people are, see what happens, see what happens if you just don't do anything. This is what I try to do. I just, I try to take six line days off. I try to say that's my Sabbath. In fact, I, I'm, I really like saying six line Sabbath. I'd like to have a six line Sabbath kind of lifestyle where every six line day, that's the day I don't work. But Honestly, I'm still too insecure to give myself that six line day off. Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Okay, I'm gonna talk about solar returns really briefly, but since we've talked about the seasons and the equinoxes being related to a place in the wheel, and we've talked about the new year, there's a place in the wheel, there's a place in the wheel where the sun passes that is related to you personally, and that's your solar return. Not necessarily the same day as your birthday, but probably within one day. But that's where the sun returns to the place in the sky where it was when you were born. And it's not just a day, it's a line. There's a line frequency. Your personality has a frequency. It's different than the other five line days. So here's an example for me. Uh, this past year, uh, my birthday on the, this kind of calendar was April 10th, but you know, my son is in the sixth line of 51. So really this year, my, my solar return was uh, on April 9th instead of April 10th. Um, you also have a design birthday. Remember that your design birthday is about three months before your, uh, your personality birthday. So that's where the sun was when your body consciousness was imprinted. And there's a line there and there's a frequency for that line. So I encourage you all to look at that. So here's mine, it happens in January. Um, I like noticing this day. It happens to be during this month between the winter solstice and the rave new year. Um, maybe that supports me noticing that, but it's a day for me to, you know, I can't really directly observe my own inner truth mystery thing. It's second line and it's, you know, it's in the tunnel. I can't see it, but I can, I can respect it and, and give an extra bit of love to my body on that day. And there's a practical thing to do here too. There is a zone between your design birthday and your personality birthday. And uh, I confirmed this recently. Ra really does tell people. In fact, he said it was some of the oldest advice that he ever gave was don't make any big decisions during that time between your design and your personality birthdays. Um, because you think about it, your body has, has entered a new year. There's a new imprint for it, but your personality hasn't yet. So I put this out on Facebook and there were a lot of, um, a lot of stories from people about like good things happening and things happening. Um, and also other stories about feeling really stuck during this time. Um, so the point is, Stick with your strategy and authority for sure. And don't make any big decisions if you don't have to, so to speak. Um, personally, I have violated this rule year after year after year. I didn't really, I don't know. I guess I just didn't know about it for a long time. But looking back, like the last three springs, four springs, you know, I left here, this my place in Mexico, to go somewhere and do something. Three times it was men in Europe. And another time it was a, a dog rescue center in Costa Rica. And I'm gonna mention this story for the manifestors. Uh, you know, I saw this posting, it was sometime in January, like right around now, or excuse me, right around the 
new year where they said, Hey, we need a manager at this dog rescue place. And, you know, I, I liked Costa Rica. I liked dogs. I had experience rescuing dogs in Costa Rica. Sounds like a great idea. You know, I do a bunch of changes to get out of my lease and blah, 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 blah. I do all these things. And I go down there in like March and in the first hour I was at this place, I knew it wasn't going to be right. The sounds were wrong. The smells were wrong. The people were wrong. And I was like, oh my God. And basically another one of my expensive mistakes. And um, yeah, I basically, I ended up in, I did, ended up not staying at the dog place. Uh, and yeah, found my way into another country that I wasn't even expecting to go to. And that's how things go for me. But all of that said, if I had been aware of this rule at the time, maybe I wouldn't have done that. But the other part I wanna say about that is that what I understand now is that I don't think it's ever going to work for me as a somewhat deconditioned manifester to go join somebody else's project to go manage something that somebody else started. Um, you know, when I walked into that dog rescue place, I mean, immediately I saw things and smelled things that were not how I would do it. And it wasn't okay with what, what I was picking up from the dogs. And so I had to like spend a couple of days figuring out, maybe this is an emotion, open solar plexus thing. How do I tell this, you know, this German woman who's here in Costa Rica doing what seems like, you know, really saintly work, rescuing dogs. How do I tell her how wrong these things are? And then eventually I figured out I can't, I just, I just have to tell her it's wrong for me. So note to self, uh, note to manifestors. If you're in this process of deconditioning and, and becoming a manifestor, um, don't expect that you can execute something for, for somebody else. You know, it's, uh, yeah, in my experience, it doesn't turn out well. Okay, you all have designed birthdays. I looked them up for you. Uh, you might wanna look at your ephemeris to confirm that date, but um, everybody, you can look out for those. Okay, I am almost done talking. So if you need some things to think about, what is a calendar? Who made it and why? And does it serve you? That's for your mind. Ah, and here's the candle image. And I do have some words that I wanna share here. I'm going to find them <laughs> on this other device. And of course, these are from Raw. And um, it's lovely for me to see that, that so many of you have already sort of picked up on things that he's saying here. And even in your comments earlier today, um, I hope you get that I'm, I'm suggesting that there is a kind of an, an interregnum between the winter solstice and the rave new year. You don't have to get all your stuff together and your plans for what's gonna happen next year by the 31st. You don't have to be done pruning out people from your life and, and figuring out what's gonna, you know, what do you leave behind in, of 2021? You've got a whole lunar cycle ahead of you before the sun is gonna support you in something new. So my encouragement is to take this time and let yourself let things go, eat what you need to eat, sleep as much as you need to, um, you know, do the pruning, but there's no need to hurry for the next week. You've got at least another lunar cycle before the sun will pick you up and, and, and encourage you into your new solar year. So here we go. I'm going to read from Raw now. In this process of discovering yourself and discovering love for yourself, you begin to see those beings who are incorrect all around you in your life. You get to see all of that conditioning that has always been around you, that has never been there to serve you. And you get to see yourself in the way in which you mentally frame that world that you live in. 
you get to see how much conditioning has stuck to your mental process, how much of that stuff that you keep in your own mind in the way in which you see things. The deeper and closer you get to your own nature, what begins to ultimately be cleansed is the way in which the conditioning drops away from your mind, that you, stopped, that you stop being concerned about the expectations, about the needs and the desires of others, that you begin to see that it is not the point in this life, that it was never the point in this life, that the only point is that you live your purpose, your potential. And that whoever is going to be there in your life is going to be there because it's correct that they're there. Not because of some conditioned reason, not because of some propagandized, homogenized concept. We're not going to be able to break away from the patterns of the past until we break away from the patterns of the past. And that's where the courage is. And we're not going to have company. There's never going to be any more than the 4% of the 4%. That's a possibility. This is something you do on your own. And in doing it on your own, where you can have that effect on those that are there on your fractal, those that are there because you can truly influence because it is correct for you to influence them. Every time you change that one person at a time, you transform the world around you and you protect yourself in that world around you. Thank you for being here, being on my fractal and letting me share this experience. Here's my final image. And ah, all right, I'm gonna close that screen there. Let's see, oops, I'm not controlling that very well, am I? Let's see, um, let's see. I don't know how to gracefully get out of that. I guess I'll go here. Oh, I know, I can do the stop share. Okay, and I'm going to 